I have personally found that having a mission in life is really, really important for my mental health and also my understanding of myself as a man and my masculine energy. So when I say mission, what do I mean? I mean heroic purpose, sacred duty, or a higher calling. So now let's get into why I think this is important and how you understand what your mission is. So one of the primary things that you need to understand about a mission is that it is often a higher calling, which I'll unpack that in a little bit, but on more concrete terms or in more objective terms, a mission is usually a calling to change or fix something in the world. You need to go create something, you need to rectify a wrong, or otherwise get out there and change something and add something to the world. This is part of the uh, motivation or ambition of a man. And so what I mean by that is that there's something that you feel compelled to go do, to go fix. Um, and because of this, because it feels like a compulsion or a higher calling, it's often can be thought of as a purpose or a duty. Now, before we get any further in, I do want to address that there is nothing intrinsically masculine or manly about missions. In fact, many women and, and other feminine people have missions. Um, but what I will say is the observation that in many cases, uh, women uh, have a different kind of mission. It's usually about finding meaning or connection or, or uh, something else. Uh, now, again, there's also nothing intrinsically saying that only men can have heroic purposes. There are plenty of women in the world who do have heroic purposes. But I also do want to just kind of remind you that, like, that's not my experience. I'm not a woman or a feminine person. And that's not who this video is for. So, uh, but yeah, no, like there are plenty of women out there who have heroic purposes. And also one thing that I will say, understanding from the, from the Jungian perspective that we all have the anima and animus, if a woman is engaging in a heroic uh, mission, she's likely engaged with masculine en energy. So that's kind of my perspective. Now, one way to think about the masculine mission is that it is uh, a, a heroic purpose. And so what this means is that it requires risk and sacrifice. It also requires courage and resolve, and it's often a transformational journey. So if you think about, you know, Frodo Baggins and, and Luke Skywalker and all the heroes of the MCU, it is about challenge. It is about something that feels insurmountable at times. Um, and that is one of the, that is one way that you know that you're engaged with a heroic mission is that it does seem like it is uh, above you or beyond you at times. Now that doesn't mean, you know, go fight unwinnable wars, uh, but it is a very deep uh, kind of archetypal journey that many people go on. And this is also why we keep telling stories about um, heroes that you definitely don't want to be in their shoes. Um, <laughs> heroes are in the unenviable position of having some major burden, some major task set before them that is very difficult. Um, but that is, that is the definition of a hero. Now I'm not saying that all men need, all men need to like, you know, be self-sacrificing heroes and, uh, you know, say, oh, well, woe is me. That's not what I'm saying. And we'll, we'll get into more detail in just a moment. So on that note, I do want to address the backlash to the notion of the heroic purpose, the heroic duty. So uh, in specific, this is a reaction to a video um, by Like Stories of Old, which I love that channel. So um, and, and this video that I'm referring to uh, questions the archetype or the, the, nece the necessity of a heroic uh, masculine purpose. Um, and it's a great video and you should go watch it. However, what I will say is that while some of the criticism is justified because we romanticize this and idealize it and, uh, you know, create uh, kind of these expectations that are unrealistic, not every man is going to be James Bond or Tony Stark or something like that. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to cheapen the, um, how just essential having a mission, um, feels to me as a man. Um, and so, yes, like we don't want to have unrealistic expectations that everyone's going to be, you know, the hard driving, hard drinking, you know, James Bond or uh, what was it billionaire playboy philanthropist, you know, genius Tony Stark. Um, that is an unrealistic set of expectations. And that aspect of this trope does bear criticism, but I don't want to categorically throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, ah, well, just because there's this cartoonish trope out there about heroic masculine duty or purpose um, that means that the entire institution is bad. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. So it's, you know, as with all things, striking, striking a balance between realism and idealism. 
So on the topic of mission and in terms of thinking of it as a higher calling, uh, one way that you can think about your higher calling or, you know, the heroic mission or the, the, the masculine purpose that you might have is that it's going to be something that you are uniquely uh, suitable for, whether it's the context that you're in, the skills that you have, the situation of your birth, the friends, uh, the experiences that you have. Um, it's going to be something that's particular to you. Um, it's going to be rooted in your life experiences, both good or bad. So um, I will address trauma more in just a, a, a moment. But what I will say is that uh, sometimes a tragic backstory is actually a, a good source of motivation for mission. And so like if you experience some kind of major setback in your life, often in childhood, not always, um, this might be a clue to what your calling is because that is something that's going to give you energy. Um, so say for instance, you experience an injustice, you might have the energy for the rest of your life to fix that injustice. Um, or if there's a particular problem that you feel, uh, uniquely capable of solving, that might also be part of your, your higher calling. But the idea is that it is something outside of yourself. That is one of the key things to understand with a higher calling is that it is a calling. It is an external mission. It's not necessarily an egocentric mission. And I'll add an asterisk, as with all things, it's never that cut and dry uh, because there are some missions that are very internal as well. So speaking, though, of those darker missions, um, there are plenty of missions that are driven by either egotistical motivations or by uh, trauma in its various forms like anger, pain, fear, greed, those sorts of things. And so in many cases... Some some of the most ambitious and motivated and mission-driven men in history have done really horrible things. And so you can, this is, this is why those, those kind of dark side emotions are often pathologized as evil, particularly in um, archetypal stories. You know, Sauron was greedy. He wanted to control the world for arbitrary reasons, um, as, a, as a perfect example. Um, Star Wars with Darth Vader or Anakin is another example of where, where dark side emotions such as Pain, the fear of loss, leads someone on a dark mission. So this is this is a, a perfect example of those kind of archetypal evil missions where someone is trying to protect themselves or soothe themselves. And so if your mission is egocentric in that respect, it is more likely to become uh, a dark mission or a good intention could be twisted by those negative emotions, such as trying to self-soothe your, your pain, fear, trauma, or whatever. And so one of the cardinal rules to keep yourself on track is to remember that the ends never justify the means. Um, the means are the way. The end that the outcome is not a guaranteed thing. Um, and so don't put the cart before the horse. Make sure that every step that you take is the right step. Um, because if you, if you say, ah, well, there's some outcome that I'm looking for in the distant future and anything that I can do to make that happen is the right way. That's a teleological outlook, which is not necessarily um, intrinsically bad, but if your motivations to take the wrong step are there, uh, then, then it's more likely to go sideways, <laughs> put it that way. Another way to uh, kind of safeguard yourself against straying from the path is having a moral framework. This means having guiding principles, um, you know, some sort of guiding North Star that is going to keep you on the straight and narrow. Uh, and this is some set of values or principles. It can come from any number of sources. You can have religious principles, philosophical beliefs, uh, personal convictions, so on and so forth. Now, one thing that I do want to say, though, is that religious frameworks, philosophical frameworks, other dogmas and convictions, these can still steer you in the wrong direction. Um, and so it's very, it's very important to reflect deeply on what your moral framework is and to very carefully cultivate it and also recognize that your morals evolve over the course of your life. So I don't want to dive too deeply into it, but if you want to understand what I mean, look up Lawrence Kohlberg and his stages of moral development. And so the stages of moral development are actually also reflected in the hero's journey where the naive hero who steps out has big ideas about how the world works and part of the hero's journey is learning what does and doesn't work, which honestly here, I'll just, <laughs> I'll own up to the fact that I recently had a, 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 an acute case of foot and mouth syndrome where on another channel, I said something rather boneheaded and um, I hurt a, at least a couple friends of mine and I owned up to it. And that is part of the moral development 
which is that while you're on your transformative hero's journey, on your mythic purpose or your your masculine mission, um, you will make mistakes. And the key is to learn. And also part of that learning means updating your models about uh, values, principles, and how the world works. Another aspect of your heroic masculine duty is that it does require sacrifice. So this means time, energy, resources, those sorts of things. Um, but one thing that I will say is that it should never require you to sacrifice your friends or your family. If you feel like your mission does require you to sacrifice your friends or family, you might be going astray. This is this is one of the cardinal signals. Now, one thing that I will say is that also part of the heroic journey, though, is sometimes making a judgment call or discernment and recognizing that someone is not aligned with your mission and letting that person go. So that is different than sacrificing friends or family, which is where you kind of ignore um, all the people in your life, um, which is why I chose this image specifically is because part of uh, a heroic mission is finding those friends and allies and mentors. Um, you cannot do a mission alone, um, but the more engaged you are with your mission, the more that uh, friends, allies, and mentors will show up. And I have found this to be incredibly true. It was very strange when I started my my mission on YouTube around AI. I had people just coming out of the woodwork. Um, and that sounds a little pejorative. I don't mean it that way, but I mean people just showing up and saying, how can I help? I want to help you because you're clearly on uh, on a mission. So that is part of it. Another thing that you should absolutely never sacrifice is your principles. Never sacrifice your integrity. That is the last thing that you have. Um, in terms of engaging and prosecuting your mission. In fact, your principles or your, 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 your values, your integrity is how you achieve the mission. And part of the mission is that your values will be tested. So for instance, um, I'm constantly getting asked to, you know, kind of sell out whether, you know, for advertising, um, or, you know, to consult or, you know, someone wants to invest in me. And, and then if they, if, if I agree to that investment, then that gives them some level of control. And those are constant tests of my values and my values are, I value open source. I value individual autonomy, um, but I also value my mission. And so that means that I have to tell a lot of people no. And so that's what I mean by, you know, constant tests of, uh, of integrity's values and also just, are you going to hold your course? Are you going to hold to the mission? One of the best parts, so you might say, okay, all of this sounds like not the greatest, Dave. You're not really selling this idea of like having a mission which requires sacrifice and tests and growth and, you know, occasionally stepping in it. Um, so why? Like, why would you want to do this? Um, so one I will say is that mission is the greatest source of meaning in, in your life. Uh you know, the relationships that you make along the way, the friends, the family, the loved ones, um, you know, relationships are one of the primary sources of meaning in, in life. And one of the best ways to get those allies and mentors and, and friends is by engaging with your mission, um, because you will find people as you go who are aligned with your mission. And, um, you know, and also from a masculine standpoint, a man on a mission is incredibly attractive to women. There are, there are a few things as enticing to a woman as a man who is engaged with his mission. And so engaging in my mission, you know, that's honestly one of the reasons that I attracted my now wife was that I was on an artistic mission. I'm on an intellectual mission. And she says that it's one of the most attractive aspects of me is that I'm so like focused on like achievement and purpose and growth. And it's not, you know, again, it's not about sacrificing that above all else. But, but by having that focus, that organizing principle um, in my life, it means that I'm, I have a lot of energy and I'm engaged with my passions. Um, now, what I will say is, as a caution, is um, don't you know, focus on your mission and only your mission. Again, don't sacrifice your friends, your family, your loved ones. It is a lifelong journey, and this is something that I am learning, is that it is a long slog. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes rest. So right now... Um, as I'm recording this, uh, at the beginning of February, I'm taking February off, which basically means that like, I'll only do stuff that resonates such as this video. Um, but I'm not going to like try and have a bunch of meetings or other things. I'm only going to do what's what resonates. And this is a time of rest and recalibration, um, and also reflection and consolidation of the lessons that I've learned, um, which includes reflecting on the mistakes that I've made. Um, and yeah, so uh, one thing that I'll, I'll uh, end this slide with is that 
the the trope of like the disengaged middle aged man who is like kind of just inert. Um, this is this is a sign of someone who is no longer engaged with his mission. Um, so the 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 quintessential midlife crisis where someone you know gets to a certain point in life and they panic because they feel like their life doesn't mean anything. This is because they're disengaged from their mission. And, um, you know, what some of my friends and mentors have said is that it actually makes sense that I'm pivoting in my life right now, that I'm transitioning from, uh, you know, or I have transitioned from a more conventional career and I'm engaging in something a little bit more, more personal that feels like more of a higher calling. And so like, they're not surprised that, that I'm engaging with my mission. Now, obviously, uh, this touches on a greater trend in society where because of the forces of society, because the nature of career and money and family and, you know, the suburban lifestyles that we've, we've built, it's often very difficult to engage with your mission. But this is also why you see the quintessential trope of both men and women um, who often are happier after a divorce because they're not just divorcing their spouse, they're divorcing that lifestyle. They're rejecting that suburbanite nuclear family home lifestyle and they're saying, actually, I'm going to do my own thing. And so this is this is true for both men and women who go through divorce. Men sometimes end up kind of in bad shape after divorce. Uh, after my original divorce, like, yeah, I was in bad shape for a while. And what I did was I chose to engage with my missions. Um, and that was, that was the path forward. That was the path to healing for me. Um, but also, you know, the, you see the, the trope of like the woman who goes through a divorce and she starts engaging with her friends and dating again or whatever. And so in, in both cases, um, those are men and women who have been victimized by the system, by the structure of society, rather than by each other, also by each other in some cases, um, but it's important to recognize the context that they're in. Anyways, I just wanted to say, like, this is a really important thing, is that our society is very hostile to personal missions um, because the, the, the cult of productivity says that your mission is to serve the company. Um, which is a really toxic and, and empty mission. So speaking of toxic and empty missions, I do want to um, also spend some time perseverating on realistic missions. As I said already, not everyone is going to be James Bond. Not everyone is going to be Frodo or Aragorn or Tony Stark or whatever. Uh, missions vary a lot. They vary in size and scale and impact. Um, as I mentioned, you can have artistic missions, which might be to become a good painter or write a good, good story. There are intellectual missions where you're out to solve a particular problem or understand a certain thing. Um, there's also social missions where there might be a justice or a, an injustice that you want to rectify in life. But whatever your mission is, and again, it can be almost anything, it has to resonate with personal significance. That is one of the most primary things to understand is that, and this is where I agree with the, the Like Stories of Old video, that the the Hollywood version of the mission is that it's you know about all about sacrifice and that you have to you know save the entire world from itself. Not everyone is going to be Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. Um, those are fun ex escape stories, um, but that's not necessarily a realistic or healthy outlook on what your mission is. For me, for instance, my mission brought me to YouTube where I make YouTube videos, right? And other people they make music where they sing about you know corporate greed and whatever. I'm thinking about Disturbed, by the way, because I grew up listening to Disturbed. <laughs> Disturbed is a band, um, you know, that's on a mission. Um, and so your mission can be expressed through music, through art, um, through content creation, through writing or whatever. Um, but, and, and even if that is kind of a central organizing part of your life, it's not the only part of your life, which is again, why I want to caution and make sure that your missions are realistic and that you invest, um, realistic amounts of time and energy into it. And that you also learn rest because that's something I'm still learning. Now, one thing that I have uh, said uh, on this channel since its inception, um, which is there is no substitute for passion. Uh, passion is the central most energy of masculinity. Um, and the more that I work on this channel, the more I believe that passion is the single most important signal for masculinity. Um, this is what gives you the psychic energy to do stuff. Um, it's your libido. It's your psychomotor um, motivation. It is your animating force. It is what enlivens and invigorates you to do stuff. Um, and if your passions are quenched, if you throw a bucket of cold water on your passions, this is what leads to burnout. This is what leads to disengagement and disconnection. And honestly, I think that stoicism is why so many men are disengaged. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but before I do, I just want to say like, 
libido, passion, psychomotor activation, whatever you want to call it, this is the energy that motivates you. And there is no substitute for that. And passion is the simplest single word that incorporates all of that. So as I mentioned, I suspect that stoicism is a relatively large problem. And before I continue my criticism of stoicism, I will say that stoicism is mostly good. It is like 70 or 80% good um, in terms of discipline and um, duty and virtue, the pursuit of virtue. Uh, that is something that I am big on. But my biggest single most criticism of stoicism is that it pathologizes emotion. Uh, stoicism treats emotion or passion as something that is to be treated with suspicion. You're supposed to be skeptical about emotion and they are to be managed. Um, and also uh, stoicism explicitly says that passions are bad. Um, it says, you know, there are, there are passions and including desire is a bad thing. Um, no, that means that if you, if you, if you buy into that and double down on it and you just live a life of pure sacrifice and duty with no passion, um, then you become sexually inert, um, and this is what leads to those disengaged, middle-aged, suburbanite men who are miserable in their divorce because they believe in stoicism and they're not allowed to have passion and they um, don't believe in their own mission or duty. Um, now, one thing that is somewhat paradoxical to me, though, is that stoicism also does believe in mission and does believe in a higher calling, um, but is antagonistic to the energy that gives you uh, to do those those missions. So that is sort of a kind of a catch-22 or a paradox within Stoicism. Anyways, like I said, the, the, the hostility that Stoicism has to emotion and passion, that's my chief uh, criticism. Again, 70 to 80% of Stoicism is good and valid and valuable. Um, so I just want to clarify on that. So as we close, I will give you some final advice. Your mission, your heroic purpose, or your sacred duty, or whatever you want to call it, um, it's going to be daunting. It's like climbing Everest. It's something that you see it and you know that it's there and you're afraid of it. You know, it does take courage. It does take a little bit of chutzpah or, you know, cojones or whatever to engage with your mission. Um, but also it's about taking one step at a time. Um, you know, they say every journey starts with a single step. Um, and that's how you have to think of your mission. I'm getting chills thinking about that. Um, as I've also said, the importance of rest. Um, one thing that I have come to learn is that, you know, I, I started engaging with my mission, gosh, almost five years ago when I started writing. Um, and then three years ago when I started my YouTube channel, it is a long slog. It is, it's not a, it's not a marathon. It's not a sprint. It is a long walk. <laughs> it takes the rest of your life. And so, um, recognizing that you'll have periods of winters where you will need to stop and rest and disconnect for sometimes six months at a time, maybe even longer, um, particularly if you hit burnout. Um, another thing is be prepared for mixed reactions. Uh, there's what's called change back behaviors, where if people see you changing, they will want to change you back. And so some people will say, oh, well, you know, make sure you keep your day job or stay in your lane. I still get that. Whenever I start a new YouTube channel, someone's like, oh, well, you should just stick to AI. And, but even when I started that, people said, you don't belong in AI, stick to IT, you know, stick to this other thing. Um, and I don't understand why people do that. I think it's crab mentality because, um, if, if, if you have come to believe that mission is bad or that you're not allowed to engage in your mission, then you might, if you see someone else engaging with their mission, you might say, oh, well, you shouldn't do that. Um, so don't let other people put upon you or project like that. Um, another thing is again, maintaining your integrity that is the last thing that you sell, like non-negotiable, stick to your principles, stick to your guns, stick to your virtues um, at all costs, because at the end of the day, succeed or fail, um, if, you sell, if you sell out, you, you sacrifice your virtues, it'll be a hollow victory. And then finally, um, your childhood is probably going to be a, a, a big clue to what your mission or purpose is. Um, in my case, I had people telling, basically telling me what my mission was when I was little, they told me that I was gifted. They told me that I was, I was, um, I was special in terms of my ability to be observant and to think through things. And, but also the, the negative experiences that I had in childhood, um, the problems that I saw with society, you know, my parents went through a divorce and, and, uh, the problems that I had in school, all of those childhood experiences speak to my heroic purpose, my masculine duty as an adult. And so Again, it's not always true. Sometimes, sometimes the catalyst event happens in your adulthood, 
Um, and, it, and it can be a very clear focusing event. Like you might go live through a tragedy. Like there's stories of someone who survives a plane crash and then that awakens them to their heroic purpose. Um, but in many cases, it is rooted in childhood. So I have a book to recommend. It's called The Genius Myth by Michael Mead, um, which which is an entire book about reconnecting and rekindling with your uh, with your childhood self in order to understand what your purpose is, what your genius is. So thank you for watching to the end. Um, yeah, like, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. You know the drill. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, also on Patreon, I've got uh, almost... 20, uh, over 2,300 people on Patreon. Um, some of them are on the free tier. You're welcome to join the free tier if you want updates, but also your support would uh, go a long ways. And if uh, for all paying members, you get access to my exclusive Discord and my monthly uh, webinar series, which is basically a town hall Q&A. Um, I'm also on Spotify now. Um, so uh, yeah, all the links are in the, uh, in the description. There we go. I can speak. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. Cheers. Have a good one.